I was thinking about what God gives us in the book of Revelation, chapter 19. The book of Revelation, the very last book of the Bible, tells us of things that are yet to come. And three chapters from the end, in chapter 19, verse 11, listen to what John's, John the Apostle, what he saw. He says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He is dressed in a robe dripped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. On his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus has promised to return, and if he's promised to return, what's he going to do? He will return. He will return for his bride, and he's coming as a victorious one. He is the word of God. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. But if you notice in verse 11, it actually gives us his nickname. What, what's the nickname? John says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called... His nickname is Faithful and True. What does it take? What is required to have a name be faithful? Our God, in our text today, he identifies himself. He says, my name is Faithful. He is one who is abounding in faithfulness. And the testimony today, and some of you, many of you can say amen, is that God is faithful. He is so faithful faithful. Our brother Alan uh, a few weeks ago said, hey, I want to share. So he has a testimony about God's faithfulness. Do you know, all know Alan Croucher? Would you welcome him as he shares with us? Good morning. I just want to give you the cliff note version of what my wife and I have been through in the last 10 months and just God's faithfulness in our life. Um, back in September, I went into the hospital with pneumonia and um, the leading theory is that I had an interaction with um, an IV antibiotic and one of my long-term anti-rejection medications for my kidney transplant, and it caused that medication to go toxic. And that did a bunch of neurological damage to my legs, my feet, and my brain. And shortly after I got out of the hospital, my legs seized up and I couldn't move, and I was walking through our house, and I fell, and I... Um, burst fractured my T11 um, vertebrae. It just totally disintegrated. And um, so I'm an inch shorter now than I was back in September. <laughs> and um, so for the next five weeks, um, I was in either the hospital or rehab. Um, I was in the hospital for a week and then I went to rehab and then I went back to the hospital after a week and then I was back in the rehab for two more weeks after that. But during that time, um, there was a, a thing called a Sarah study that they would bring for me to, to get up if I had to go to the bathroom or go to a different room. And it took all my strength just to be able to stand up on that. And then they'd lower a seat and I'd sit down and then they'd move me. But it was, I could hardly stand up on that and half the time they'd have to help me. And um, God's been so faithful through all of this because now I can walk again. I was in a wheelchair for seven months and then I used a walker for two months. And then just like a month ago, I was able to get, get around without the walker. And then last week, just another example of God's faithfulness, I got up in the morning and I walked to the other room and I walked like Frankenstein's monster. And then um, that afternoon I got up to go to the kitchen and my normal gait had returned and I could just walk normal again. Um, I can still only walk about 50 yards, but I can walk 50 yards where, you know, a couple of months ago I couldn't walk at all. And um, we've been just amazed um, at God's faithfulness to all of this. It hasn't made sense to us. We don't, we don't understand it. There was one point in the hospital when the doctors told me I had ALS. And um, I have to tell you, I was heartbroken. I was, I was angry with God and I was hurt. And I told God, 
I said, if you're going to stick me with this disease, I never want anything to do with you again. But then the next morning I was praying to him again because I didn't know where else to turn. And even in my, my failing, God still was faithful and he still loved me. And he's just continued to, to bless my wife and I through all of this. And I can't, I can't thank him enough. And the faithfulness that he has in this church family so many of you were praying for us through this whole thing. Um, the church I grew up in was praying for us. Um, my, my wife's folks' church, they were praying for us. There was just hundreds and hundreds of people praying for us. And God's answered prayer just constantly through this whole thing. And again, I don't understand it. It's not been right what's happened. But we just sometimes we just have to trust God and we just have to walk through the things that are going on in our life and in our suffering because God will still be there by our side and he'll never leave us, he'll never forsake us. And I wanna share a verse with you. Uh, my wife shared this with me last night and it just, it really touched my heart. It's First Corinthians, or Second Corinthians 1, 3. It says, praise be to God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and of the God of all comfort. Even in our suffering, God is there and he loves us and he's faithful through it. And it may not make sense at the time, but we just have to trust in him and know that he's gonna, gonna see us through and be with us through all of it. So I'd just like to pray over you this morning and just um, let you know that, that God is faithful. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for today. I thank you for each person here but Father, I just I th can't thank you enough for your faithfulness, how you stand by us through the hard times and the good times. And Father, we don't always understand what's going on. And Father, we don't always understand your timing or how your what your plan is, but Father, you are so, so faithful. And I just thank you for that. And I just pray, Father, a special blessing on each person here today that they would just know and can feel your presence, Father. I ask these things in your son's precious name. Amen. 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 <laughs> Alan has served uh, years, decades with young people. That's his heart. And also, is, he's in my top 10 list of Norkenzie elders ever. I mean, he's like my favorite <laughs> list. And uh, so thank you, Alan, for sharing. It means a lot. Today, we want to talk about God's faithfulness. And I'm wondering, where, where will you find your security in life? Jesus didn't say, follow him, and then the storms of life wouldn't affect you. He actually said, the storms of life affect all of us. Where are you going to find your security? And what we want, where we want to find our security is in God himself, because he offers us himself to be this rock upon which we can base our lives, a rock that is firm and secure. We've been in this series, What is in a Name? And just some truth and review, in case you didn't know, we're studying out of uh, Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7, where God tells Moses who he is. His name is Yahweh, he, uh, the Lord, the Lord, Yahweh. He is the ever-present I am God. And for his good, for his glory, right, he sends Moses, he sends us. So he tells Moses, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. This is who God is. So if we go back to the last verse, uh, we see where we've been. We've talked about his name, Yahweh, the Lord. He is a merciful, compassionate God. He is gracious. Right? He is slow to anger and abounding in love. This is who he is. God feels for us. He is for us. Uh, he's not surprised by anything we might do or think. He is committed to us because of who he is. And there is strength found in his name. Today, we want to talk about him being faithful. He's abounding in love and faithfulness, he says. 
God is a faithful God. He is forever faithful. Whenever this word faithful is, you know, the Old Testament words used uh, for faithful, the idea is firm and constant. That's why it, you often see, like in the Psalms, for instance, the reference to God as my rock, right? Because he, he, it's a reference to his faithfulness. He is firm and unmoving and constant. You can depend on him. The idea being, right, with this firm, consistent, constant God, you can place your trust in him. You can find security in him. So Psalm 18, for instance, verse 2, when the psalmist writes, the Lord is my rock, right? The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. God is faithful. He is firm and constant. In Deuteronomy 32, uh, through Moses, you know, he, it says of God, right? He is the rock. God is the rock. His works are perfect. All his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong. Upright and just is he. Where did Moses get this idea? When God passed in front of him, gave him his name. He is abounding in faithfulness. He is forever, forever faithful. God is the one we can place our trust, and God is faithful to keep his promises, the promises he makes to his people. He is faithful to keep them because of who he is. It's similar to when we talked about love last week. God doesn't love. God, love is not something God does, we said. Love is something God is. And in a similar way, God is faithful. He is firm and constant. He's not a roller coaster. He's a rock, all right? In Romans chapter three, as we're studying Romans, in, the, in Paul's thought through chapters one and two, and then the beginning of verse three, verse three, Paul asks this question. What if some are unfaithful? The, the history of the Jews was, was a roller coaster. Their unfaithfulness, faithfulness, unfaithfulness. So Paul's asking, what, what if some are unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? It's a good question. And before we say not at all, which is the answer, let's be honest. When we are struggling in life and temptation and sin comes our way, and it's that old cycle, I mean, it's not dissimilar to what the Hebrews were doing, we can uh, think our unfaithfulness is somehow going to reflect on God and his faithfulness. Like, uh, can, he, can, he, can he forgive me once again? Can he love me again? Can our unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? My friends, the answer is not at all. Because our unfaithfulness is not that strong. If you think your unfaithfulness, your inability to be faithful, somehow negates or nullifies the strength of God Almighty, you need to hear about God's faithfulness today. He is a faithful, true God. He is a rock. He is a refuge. He's a fortress. He's your stronghold. He's the one you run to. When do you run to him? When you're feeling strong and great? No, no, no. You run to a refuge when there is trouble. He is firm. He is constant. And he right, is making this relationship available to us. We can know this God today. Um, I sent my first three, oldest three daughters to the wrong state to go to college. They ended up going to Boise Bible College, you know. And if you've ever been to Boise, you may or may not know this, but kind of northeast of the city is this place called Table Rock. And I actually have a, I, I messaged my oldest three daughters and their husbands, and I said, what's, what's the name of that rock, you know, outside of Boise? You can look down onto the city. And, uh, and I had forgotten. It's like, oh, Table Rock, Table Rock, right. And what ensued was my three daughters and their husbands all sending me pictures. And so I have pictures of Table Rock, you know, like this. Uh, oh, over here. This one's, <laughs> those, those aren't my kids. Those are, those are internet celebrities. But this is my daughter, Katie, standing at Table Rock. I mean, it's kind of a cliff there, right? And I think I have one of, is it Mary? Oh, this is Annie and her friend. We're sitting there at Table Rock, looking out over the city. Right? And then this one made my heart skip a little bit. Here's Mary 
And I had, I've not been there, but I'm like, whoa, I didn't know you could take your life into your own hands. So what are you doing? I raised you better than that, right? And then there's Silas, right? My son-in-law, uh, missionary and on the, on the wrong side of the world serving Jesus. Uh, so there is, I was explained, there's, it's, it's a little bit of a, but there's, there's more rock underneath, right? Okay. <laughs> This, this one is Silas, too, and uh, he took this one with my daughter because some people actually go up to Table Rock and propose marriage, right? So I've never been there, but let's say you and I, we all go to Table Rock. Oh, by the way, they put a cross. Someone they put, and I, I even said, I said, that looks big, and they said, it is big. It's a big cross at Table Rock overlooking Boise, and so uh, people can... People can see it. But let's say you and I, we go to Table Rock, and it's like we're looking at the beautiful view. And I say, it's so great. Get on my shoulders so you can get a little bit higher. Because then the view will be even better. We're going to be up here for 10, 14 hours. But just get on my shoulder so you can see the view better. Does that sound like a good idea? I know it's 102 degrees out here. But get on my shoulders because I'm going to carry you. I'm going to give you a wonderful experience looking out over the Treasure Valley. Get on my shoulders so you get on my shoulders. It's 102. You're depending on me for this great view. But it's 102. And eventually, probably at the 13th hour, <laughs> I stumble and fall and come crashing down. And you're splat, right? Except I'm only 6'5". You didn't fall that far, really. You're fine. Why are you fine? Because Table Rock is here. It is firm. It is constant. It is immovable. Our God is faithful. He is a rock. You don't have to wonder, can he support me? Will the 102 degree weather, will the strain and stress of life somehow make it so God can't deliver on his promise? You know, what we end up doing is you end up trusting your pastor. I, I remember having kind of, you know, introduction to Norkenzie classes, and I really, people didn't believe me, but I'm like, please, what we will encourage you, and I'm going to encourage you now, is to place your trust and hope in the Lord, in God. Because your pastor here, I, I'm, I'm human. I'm, I, it's very likely in the next decade I will let you down. But I know one, and I preach about one, who will never let you down. He is faithful. He is firm. He is constant. He is a rock. You can trust him. You can depend on him. We, we tend up in various ways, you know, we trust other human beings. Or maybe you're trusting your employer. or your trust. And all the human institutions of the world run by human beings, they are not faithful like God is faithful. Because people are involved. And we struggle, don't we? But if God is your rock, God's the one. You can depend on people, but we shouldn't be so surprised when people f fall and fail. We shouldn't be so surprised when we stumble and fall and we let people down, right? The difference is, is God your rock? Are you standing on him? Uh, when Paul was talking about the Jews, you know, they're, they, God's promises were realized even though they were so unfaithful. Because he is faithful. Why is that? Well, because the fulfillment of God's promises depend on God's faithfulness. They don't depend on our conduct or our ability. They are based wholly on him and his faithfulness. And God is faithfulness. What does that mean? Our unfaithfulness, our unbelief are not powerful enough to overcome God. He is stronger. Would you agree? God is stronger. He is faithful. So I think about 2 Timothy, great passage in 2 Timothy chapter 2, where Paul says, here is a trustworthy saying. And it's a, a poetic little paragraph here. Here's a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful because he can.
cannot disown himself. We think it might say something different, but it doesn't. You know, if we disown him, if you're walking with God or, you know, and you just, you just disown God. See, God has created us in his image with the ability to think and to feel and to reason and to choose. And you can look at the world today and know that there is a God and he's made it very possible and for you to know him and follow him. But if you want what you want when you want it and you end up saying, I don't want God, God never forces himself on you. If you disown him, he loves you. I mean, he respects you enough as a creation in his image to disown you. He's not gonna force himself on you. So we think when he says, and if we, when we are faithless, what do we think it's gonna say? Oh, no, no, no. If we are faithless, he remains faithful because it's his name. It's who he is. And he cannot disown himself. For God to not be a rock, to not be faithful, would be to disown his very character, and he's not gonna do it. So our unfaithfulness is not strong enough to overcome his faithfulness. So I want to ask you again, where will you find security in your life? You can depend on other people, but ultimately, is that where you find it? Maybe you find it in your ability to be right and good and, you know, holy and uh, doesn't always work out. Or, and this is the right choice, can you find your security in God's faithfulness to you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He is with us now, being true to his promises because of who he is. He is faithful. So guess what happens to us when we are in relationship with a God who is forever faithful? Just take a guess. Guess what happens to us if we are in a relationship with God who himself is forever faithful, what happens is the strength of God changes us and we become increasingly more faithful. You know, the adage is true. You become like who you hang out with. You, you know, they, they rub, your friends rub off on you. If you spend time with Jesus, he rubs off on you. And by his spirit, you know, the fruit of the spirit Right? This Galatians 5, you know, love and joy and peace. We know those. We become like Jesus. Love and joy and peace. Do you know the, the other ones? Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and did you know that faithfulness is one of the fruit of God's Holy Spirit? And the more time you spend with Jesus and the more you depend, I mean absolute depend on him as the rock on which you stand, you become more faithful. The strength of who he is rubs off on you and me, and we become more faithful. And the people around us are blessed because they might see Jesus in us. They might find you know, the security of God through our lives as we live for him. Our growing confidence in God's faithfulness then, right, does not lead us to more failure. Our growing confidence in God's faithfulness does not lead us to more failure. It actually leads us to worship him. It leads us to relationship. And the more we are with him, the more faithful we become. That's why it's totally in the scripture. It's absolutely assumed that if, as you follow Jesus, you're going to become more like him. And the struggles and the temptations and the sins that you plagued you when you first came to, to Christ you will grow out of the, you grow out of those, why? Because you're so good? No, 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 because you're with, with the Lord. And his faithfulness is the rock of your life and you learn faithfulness by being with him. So when struggles come, and they still come, they still come, we don't give up, we don't throw it in, nope. We depend in God's ability to be a rock for us. Our confidence is in his ability. There's some scriptures, of course, 1 John 1, 8 and 9. 
uh, well-known, you may know this, you know, John writes in his letter, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So we have a back corner. If you are here today and you claim that you never have sin and you don't sin ever, uh, we want to talk to you. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> what does it say? If we claim to have no sin, what is happening? Verse eight, we actually deceive ourselves. We're lying to ourselves. Probably all the people in your family and the people you work with, they're not deceived. They, they have a clear picture. But if you claim to be without sin, you're deceiving yourself. And the truth, you know, you're not living by the truth because it's just not true. If, if any of us could live perfectly without sin, there would be no need for a savior. But guess what we're celebrating today? There is a savior who laid down his life, shed his own blood so that our sins could be forgiven. That's the truth. If we say we don't need that, the truth is not in us. And then verse nine, if we confess our sin, not deny that we have it. No, 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 I don't sin. No, no, no. If we confess our sins, God is, say it with me, God is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. This is the relationship we've been invited into where we can be honest with God. He is our rock, our, our refuge. When we sin, we confess, knowing he is faithful to his promise. The blood of Jesus is still applied to our lives, and our lives are purified from all of that that would separate us from him. And as we walk daily in his presence, his faithfulness rubs off on, on us, and we become increasingly more faithful because of his ability, because of his spirit, because of his word, the power of his word in our lives, we can actually live lives that bring glory to him. Sounds awesome, right? This is what we're called to. This is what we get to do. In the Bible, there is a direct correlation, a direct connection between God's faithfulness and ours because we are in this relationship with him. We're, he, he, remember, he feels for us, Right? He's merciful, compassionate, gracious. Toward, he feels for us, and he is for us. He doesn't want us to be plagued by the things that plague human beings. He wants us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, to depend on his faithfulness, and to know that by his spirit, we are helped from day to day. Don't wake up tomorrow morning and think, this is a great day. This is a day that I don't need the Lord's help. I've had a great week. I don't need the Lord's help today. Pride goes before a, man, you look out. You'll probably trip out the front door. Every day is a day to rely on the faithfulness of God. This is the day where he is a rock, and you can build your life on him. What do we do with the sin? Well, 1 John helps us, but there's more. His faithfulness helps us. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Verse 11 and 13, Paul, in chapter 10, Paul is talking about Israel's history, right? Exodus, and, and he, so he says these things, what happened to Israel, were examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful so that you don't fall. And then here's the verse. You need to underline this, highlight this. If you're struggling with temptation and sin, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. So catch this. God doesn't, uh, temptations come our way every day, all the time, various places. It's living in the flesh. It's just our existence but we're walking with God. He doesn't allow any temptation that, uh, to come your way that is totally overwhelming you, like you, there's no chance. And the reason that there's never a temptation that is so big, so big, that there's no way out of it is because God is faithful and God is with you. And he actually, we're gonna see, you know, he actually keeps limitations on the evil one and the temptations that come your way. Temptations still come, but oftentimes, you know, it's an opportunity to grow. Will we trust God? He is faithful, right? He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, when you are tempted, he also provides a way out so that you can endure it. This is an adventurous way to live, my friends. Totally dependent on the faithfulness of God. Living on him as the rock 
And when temptation comes, knowing this is common to people, the enemy of your soul really wants you to be, feel like you're the only person on the planet that ever struggles with this particular temptation. You're the only one. You're the only one. <laughs> it's common to people. And God doesn't let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. But when we are tempted, he will find a way out. So the adventure is, here's temptation. Here's the opportunity to sin. God's providing a way out. Where is it? I'm looking for it. You're praying, God, show me the way out, Lord. He shows it to you. You walk in faith. It's a good day. It's a good day. In uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul's writing to the church in Thessalonica, and he says, as for the other matters, brothers and sisters, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored, just as it was with you. And pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil people. You know, there are wicked and evil people under the influence of evil in the world. It's not hard to see it, but scripture affirms that there are wicked and evil people. Paul's asking for prayers so that they can be delivered for, from such people. And he says, for not everyone has faith, but the Lord is faithful. The Lord is a rock. You can depend on him. You can trust him. The Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. So with 1 Corinthians 10 in mind, you won't be tempted beyond what you can bear. He's going to provide a way out. He actually will strengthen and protect you from the enemy of your soul. Because God is that strong. He is a rock. And he is faithful. And he wants your good and mine. Don't listen to the lies of the enemy. Believe in the one who is faithful. And then in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, Hebrew writer says, let's, let's hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Listen, you might be in a dark night of the soul. You might be in a really bad place, but hang on, hold on unswervingly to this hope we have in Jesus. Why? Because God is faithful. He is faithful. You can depend on him. So what does it mean then to know a God whose nickname is faithful and true. When Jesus comes again, he will be called faithful and true. What does it mean to know a God like this? It means you and I, we can build our lives on him. We can build our lives on him. He is that firm foundation. Jesus talked about it at the end of Matthew 7. Build your life on him. The storms of life come and your life will hold steady and be strong. But don't listen to the words of Jesus, not put them into practice because he said it's like building your life on sand and the same storms of life come, beat against your house and splat. It falls with a great crash because God is the one who is the rock. We can lean into each other, God gives us one another, but he is our rock. We can help one another along, we can encourage one another in faith, we're called to do that. But he is our faithful God.